Good morning, everyone. It's uh, very good to gather with you in Jesus' name to worship him uh, and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, We'll open with a few words from the Psalms before we sing uh, together. These words come from Psalm 68, where it says, Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs escape from death. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ever bless and thank you that we have uh, not some imagination to worship, not some uh, God of uh, our own minds or making, that we have you, Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven, who is the God of salvation, the God of our salvation. With you is the truth, the light, the way of living, escape from death. Father, we pray that you should make yourself present and known amongst us in the Holy Spirit, that you would be in us and between us and with us for Jesus' sake, that we'd be made more like him as we see him in your word. Amen. Our first reading this morning is going to come from Psalm 68, and then once we've read the first 20 verses of that psalm, we'll read 1 Corinthians 12. So Psalm 68 and the first 20 verses. Now Psalm 68 is notoriously difficult to interpret and understand. There's lots of unique words and phrases in there that uh, we puzzle over to understand what they mean. So let me just give you a general theme to have in mind uh, as we read and hopefully that will help us. This psalm is about the exaltation of Christ. It is about his conquest, his victory in all of his purposes and about how that, uh, that victory that Christ has overlaps with the well-being and the prosperity of his people. The goodness of his people and the glory of God, they crash into each other. They are the same thing. So let's read the Psalm 68, the first 20 verses. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O God, sent a plentiful rain whereby you confirmed your inheritance. When it was weary, your congregation dwelt in it. You, O God, provided from your goodness for the poor. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains at home divides the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove, covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalman. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in this mountain forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. 
Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. Amen. May God bless that to us. Now if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians and chapter 12, you'll read this whole chapter. 1 Corinthians and chapter 12. Now there's much here about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, which can be quite distracting at times, isn't it? It's very interesting stuff. But uh, what we're focusing on this morning, God willing, is the unity of the church family, which is also a big theme in 1 Corinthians 12. So have that in mind as we read these verses. 1 Corinthians 12 and from verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works in all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many members. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were a hearing, where would be the smelling? But, God has, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, and then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us and help us to understand it. We're going to carry on our little series in Ephesians uh, this morning. So turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians and chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. For we finished off chapters 1 to 3 before Christmas, which is the first half of this epistle. And now we're moving into the second half. And we'll read together the first 11 verses of Ephesians 4. The Apostle Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We'll leave it there. So these are the verses that we have to look at together uh, this morning. Now, uh, Paul starts chapter 4 with one of his favourite words, doesn't he, there in verse 1? Therefore. Now, you've probably heard me say it before, but when you get to the word therefore in your readings, what question are you supposed to ask yourself? You say, what is the therefore, therefore? We're moving into the second half of Ephesians this morning where Paul is changing tack. He's going to talk now in this latter half of the epistle more about how to live. There's going to be now more commands, more imperatives. Live like this, do this. And he makes several addresses as we go through, speaking to different people. Uh, wives, do this. Children, do this. Husbands, do this. And so forth. Um, people, uh, employers, live like this. Employees, live like that. But Paul knows that if we forget for a moment chapters 1 to 3, we're going to get completely the wrong end of the stick when we read chapters 4 through 6. Because the conduct that he's expecting of us as Christians in chapters 4 through 6, it's not based on moralism, doing the right thing, pulling your socks up, so to speak. What is it based on? The Christian living, the good conduct that he's expecting in chapters 4 through 6 is based on what comes our way in chapters 1 to 3. This little therefore at the beginning of chapter 4, it works like this. Paul is saying chapters 1 through 3, therefore chapters 4, 5 and 6. He says doctrine is going to become now duty. He says, God has done this to you. God has done this for you, the gospel. Therefore, he says, walk like this. Walk worthy, he says. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Walking is something that uh, comes up a lot in Ephesians. Paul uses the word a number of times. He uses it to describe uh, the Christian way of life. If you, uh, you might remember it, actually. It came up a little bit in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 2, uh, let's see now. It's, it's chapter 2, verse 1, he says, You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked 
You used to walk like this. This was your way of life. A way of life marked by sin, marked by death, marked by decline. And then he says in verse 10 of chapter 2, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He says, this is the way you live now. This is the way you walk now. Now you might have even asked that question yourself of Christians, of your brothers and sisters. If you haven't asked it, you've probably heard it. How is your walk? Have you heard someone ask that? How is your walk? Meaning, how is your Christian life going? And walking is going to become more prevalent as we move through these chapters. In 4.17 it comes up um, to, to about the way we walk. Five, chapter, uh, chapter 5 verse 1, chapter 5 verse 2 and 8 and 15 and so forth. So walking is something to keep an ear out for. Paul is going to now talk to us about walking in this life. The Christian life is a walk after the Lord Jesus that is based in what God has done for us in Jesus. Now because Paul quite clearly wants us to keep an eye on chapters 1, 2 and 3 before we look at chapters 4, 5 and 6, it would be prudent of us to remind ourselves of what they said, especially seeing as we looked at them before Christmas. So what does Paul say in chapters 1, 2 and 3? How big a piece of paper could you fill with that? Or how little? How would you summarise what Paul says in the first half of Ephesians? He says, we have our one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And he has conspired together in himself to save us, to save us. That's what he's done. He says in chapters 1, 2 and 3 that the Father has chosen sinners to be tied up with his Son, the Lord Jesus. That's chapter 1, verse 4. He says that the Son, the Lord Jesus, has come into the world and has shed his own blood on the cross that you and I might be forgiven and washed of all of our sin and all of our guilt when we repent of our sin and believe into Jesus Christ. And he says that the Spirit is the one who now graciously moves into our hearts and lives as the assurance that that is true. That all that the Father has done in the Son is true. And so he says that uh, having conspired then to save us, God now ties us up with Jesus Christ. Tied, we are now tied with him. We are united with him. We are in him, he says. And instead of our life, and instead of our death, we have his life. We have his death. Do you remember that from chapter 2? And he closes this uh, first half by saying that the grace of God now goes into all the world. All that the God has done for us, his people, he does for, uh, he does for all those who shall be his. He does it for Jews and Gentiles alike. He does it for sinners all over the world. We are all saved, he says, into one church. All tied up in Christ. A new family. It's a little bit like um, you know, a, a adoption. If you think about uh, somebody might want to have a child, so they go to adopt a child and they take them home to be in their house. And they join their family. What chapters 1, 2 and 3 lead us up to is the concept that God as our Father takes sinners out of the world, out of this darkness of this world, out of sin and death and guilt, and he puts them into his house, into his family. And that's happened to all those who are his. And with chapter 4, Paul is now stepping into the next part of the story. God, having conspired in such a glorious way to save us by his son, he adds us to his family and he says, Now you must walk worthy, verse 1, of the calling with which you were called. What do you think it looks like to walk worthy? What does Paul expect Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians, the gospel, what God has done for us in Jesus, what does he expect that to do to somebody? Well, he says it in verse 2. As we read this, I want you to ask yourself, does this describe you? 
He says, walk worthy with all lowliness or humility, with all gentleness or meekness, with all long-suffering or patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, you know what I want to do. I want to go on and on and on about how these beautifully parallel the fruit of the Spirit. You know how I want to just gush and gush about how these marvellously describe our Lord Jesus and point us to his glorious character. But Paul's motive here is different. He's not talking about the way that we think, like in chapters 1, 2, and 3, the doctrines. What is he talking about here? He's talking about how we live, how we walk. It's not about thinking, it's about doing. He's getting seriously practical. He's expecting the image and the character of Jesus Christ himself to be visible in our conduct in the church. We are constrained by these verses to consider not just the theoretical, beautiful Christian life as a sort of concept, but to consider ourselves and our own conduct towards one another in the church. So our minds need to be on that page with Paul, saying, is this me, my life, my walk, my conduct? If you look at those words again in verse 2, you'll see the looming or sort of overbearing, overshadowing interpersonal focus. He even has that little phrase, with one another. And when you look at these words, they're all things which you do in relation to other people. And what that means is, there is no such thing as an isolated Christian. There's no such thing as a Christian who has nothing to do with the church. You might have heard these words, I have a number of times. They say, yes, I am a Christian, but I don't go to church. Does that make much sense to you? I mean, even without these words, does that make much sense to you? Think, how does a Christian who has nothing to do with the church obey the apostle and live like the Lord Jesus towards their brothers and sisters? The first half of the epistle labours that point. You have been placed into one new family. And now he says, live like that. Live like it's true. Our Father, he says, has put us here together to live a beautiful life together. A life marked by lowliness and gentleness and patience and so forth. Now, do you think these uh, characteristics have a theme? Do you think Paul has just picked some random, nice-sounding words? Or has he got something thematic in mind? What do you think? All these words, they have something to do with ourselves. The common theme is a sort of self-effacing or self-controlling, self-declining, a tendency downwards of ourselves. If you look at the word lowliness, it's the opposite of puffing ourselves up. It's the opposite of highliness, isn't it? It's interesting, um, apparently... When you find this word outside of the Bible, so in other books written around the same time, but not in the Bible, it is always a bad word. That's how sort of firm he's being. It's a servile submission, a slavish humiliation. It's an exaggerated opposition to our own pride and our own self of puffing up. It's a deliberate downwards. Gentleness is similar, isn't it? The opposition to extreme within ourselves, being opposite to me, is related to self-control, reining ourselves in, bridling ourselves and our passions, a self-tempering. 
About 1,600 years ago, there was a pagan prophet called Gaius Marius Victorinus. And much to his surprise, he met the Lord Jesus and was converted, became a Christian. And he stopped being a pagan prophet, he became a Christian uh, prophet in a way. And he, start, he, he wrote on these verses, he said, in AD 400-ish, he said, Paul speaks of several forms of forbearance each of which prevents us from being carried away with ourselves or proud. Lowliness, Gaius says, consists in having a humble mind, and gentleness is a curb on our pride. So it's no surprise then that we find the same words in Philippians in chapter 2, when we read about the Lord Jesus, his mind, and his conduct. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Or you have another really helpful verse in Romans 12. We could have read that earlier, couldn't we? Romans 12 verse 3 says, I say to you through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds rather idyllic. If you could find a place where everyone was like that, everyone was self-declining and uh, esteeming others more highly than themselves, if everyone was humble, if everyone was gentle, it would be utopia. Why doesn't everyone live like this? It's a bit of a no-brainer, really, isn't it? It would be marvellous. What a world to live in. The Bible teaches us that it's for the world, for the flesh, for the devil, to go up, to puff up, to climb up to be ambitious, to go up and up, higher and higher, more and more glory for myself. But it's for the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's for his family, to go down, to decline, to deny, to self-control. The Christian life is based in something exclusive. Only Christians have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that conforms them to the image of Jesus Christ and makes it possible, makes it appropriate, makes it right to downwards, self-control, lowliness, humility, gentleness. This sort of exclusive uh, basis for that conduct is what Paul goes into next in the verses 4 to 6 of chapter 4. Now, if you look over those verses, just a cursory glance, and you can tell me what do you think Paul is stressing in these verses. Can you tell? Oneness. One. Look at those verses. How many times do you read the word one in verses four to six? One body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. Do you think that he has anything else in mind? Oneness of God, unity in the church. He has these particular words that he's picked that sort of bring out a structure or a theme. And we could be here all week talking about that. But let me tell you what John Stott says about these words in verses 4 to 6. He says, here Paul describes one father who creates one family. He describes one Lord who is the Son who creates for his people one faith, one hope, and one baptism that binds them together. He says we read here about one Holy Spirit who creates one body of believers. I don't know about you, but I don't find that totally satisfactory. But it goes some way into helping us understand what Paul is talking about. He's stressing the unity of the church, which is based on our one God and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. Giving us one faith, one hope, one baptism, one calling, one Lord, one Holy Spirit. 
Everything that was in chapters 1, 2, and 3, basically, isn't it? Is the basis for our unity and our conduct that we read in chapters 4, 5, and 6. About a hundred years before Gaius said what he said, we've got John Chrysostom again. I've quoted him a few times, haven't I? You can tell I like him quite a bit. He's got a commentary on Ephesians, and he sounds rather contemporary. Sounds like he was speaking yesterday when he says about these verses, the purpose for which the Spirit was given was to bring into unity all who remain separated by different ethnic and cultural divisions, young and old, rich and poor, women and men, one in the Lord Jesus. So that's Paul's point then in this little section. We are one family in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and now we must live like God towards one another. Have you ever gone somewhere and had that spooky feeling? Everything's a bit uncanny. These people are all a bit strange. They're all a little bit like clones. Does the unity that Paul describes here for the church mean the same thing as uniformity? That everyone looks the same? The church is not a family of clones. It's not absorbed into the Godhead, so to speak, in some sort of uh, amorphous blob where everyone loses their individuality and we're all like drops in one big ocean and we lose ourselves. Look at verses 7 and 8, where having talked about all and one, Paul talks about each of us in verse 7. To each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. There is a diversity in our unity. What is the diversity in our unity? Do you see it there in those verses? What is the diversity? It's in the gifts that the risen Lord Jesus gives to his people. When he puts them into the church, into his family, under our Father in heaven, he puts us in the church, gives us the Holy Spirit, and he gives us each different gifts for the benefit of everybody else. This often comes up in Paul, doesn't it? We read in 1 Corinthians 12 where he says in that chapter, you all have gifts, each of you have gifts for the benefit of everybody else. And then he says in Romans 12, you must use your gifts for the benefit of everybody else. Another example that he's about to give us in this chapter is although we are all one in Jesus Christ, we all have different offices in the church, which must be respected and so forth. Now, that might be easy for you to say, you might think. You're up there in a pulpit, you're able to preach and so forth, but I don't feel very gifted. Do you feel very gifted? Paul knows that we don't feel very gifted a lot of the time, and so he offers us some proof here, some fascinating proof. He says in verse 7, To each of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, and he quotes from Psalm 68, he quotes from the Old Testament as proof that we all have gifts. He says, when he ascended on high, that is the Lord Jesus, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He says, the fact that we all have gifts is fulfilling Psalm 68. He says that in the ascension of the Lord Jesus, the Son, to our Father, he gives the gifts of the Holy Spirit to his people. Now, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 68. Keep your finger in Ephesians 4. And let's look at the verse that Paul just quoted. In Ephesians 4, he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. But in Psalm 68, in verse 18, he says, You have ascended on high, you have led captivity captive, you have received gifts among men. Uh oh. Do we have a problem? 
How do we explain the fact that when Psalm 68 says that the Lord Jesus received gifts of men in his ascension, Paul says that in his ascension he gives gifts to men. We might look up other translations and find that other texts of the Old Testament also have the word gave instead of received, but that hardly solves our problem. What do you think? Is one true and one false? Well, that can't be the case. Maybe both are wrong. I doubt it very much. Both must be right somehow, but how? Can giving and receiving be connected? I'll give you an illustration. Perhaps you go to a friend's house, they've invited you over for dinner or something and uh, you arrive and you happen to have brought with you a box of chocolates or some biscuits or whatever to say thanks for having me and you give them over to Mrs. So-and-so and as you do so you see Mr. So-and-so is looking a bit forlorn, a bit depressed and that's because Mr. So-and-so knows that his wife is not going to give him any of those chocolates but she's going to put them away and in the future she'll get them out and give them to somebody else. Many of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. She receives only in order to give them away. And this is what Paul is getting at. He says, a bit like how Moses receives the law from Christ on Sinai and then gives it to the people. A little bit like how in Ephesians 4 again, Jesus ascended, uh, Jesus descended in order to ascend he says, Jesus receives gifts of men in order to give gifts of men. And this is captured in lots of the Old Testament texts, uh, the translations that we don't have with us here, but other versions in Psalm 68 say that Jesus brought gifts, which gives that sense of receiving and giving. And you might, might remember how the Apostle Peter put it in Acts 2, isn't it? I'll just read this because I need to get this right because it's so important. Acts 2, verse 33, Paul says, uh, Peter says, Therefore, Jesus, being exalted to the right hand of God, ascended, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he pours out this which you now see and hear. He receives in order to give. What gifts do you think Paul has in mind specifically in Ephesians 4 when he says that Christ gives gifts to the church? He's already spoken about the Holy Spirit himself given as a gift in chapters 1, 2 and 3. Remember that? He's also speak, spoken more broadly about gifts of the Holy Spirit that Christ gives to his people. We'll get more into that in the future, I dare say. But if you look at verse 11 of Ephesians 4, you see that he gets more specific. What are the gifts he has in mind there in verse 11? But people, offices in the church, people. So when you put all these interesting little pieces together, what you find is this is what is in Paul's mind. He says that as the Lord Jesus ascends into the heavens to be with our Father and finishes the work that he has done by pouring out the Holy Spirit, he receives people to himself. There he is, the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ, receiving people. People like you. People like me. Sinners from all over the world, broken and ruined by sin and the fall, riddled with their guilt, so far away from him, so different from him in many different ways, he receives them to himself as they repent and turn to him in faith. It's lovely how it was put in Psalm 68, isn't it? That ascending on high, he received gifts of men, even the rebels, it says, even the rebellious. He receives them to himself as they repent and believe in him. Jesus sees the travail of his soul and is satisfied. Dying on the cross, he sheds his blood that they might be forgiven of their sin. Ascending into heaven, giving them the Holy Spirit, he receives them to himself and treasures their souls that he has bought with his own blood. And then, having finally won us to himself, 
having gone to the bitter end that he might have us as his own possession, he gives us back to the church, full of the Holy Spirit, to live the most unspeakably supernatural, beautiful lives together. To live lives that are marked by lowliness, bearing with one another, gentleness, peace, in the power of the Spirit. It's a beautiful life, and he's given it to us. If you would uh, let me indulge in another reference, I'll read to you how this has happened before. This is something that the Lord Jesus has done before in Numbers chapter 8 and verses 18 and 19. He says, I have taken, he's speaking about the children of Israel, he says, I have taken the Levites, the one tribe in Israel, I have taken them instead of all the firstborn of the children of Israel. I have taken the Levites and I have given the Levites as a gift to the people. He does it again and again. You have it again in Numbers 18 and verse 6 in one verse. Behold, I myself have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the children of Israel, and they are a gift to you, given by the Lord to do the work of the tabernacle. Taken by Christ as hard-won treasure, and then given back to serve the church in a way that reflects even himself. What a story. What a privilege to be able to just know that story, let alone be participants in that story. When we think of chapters 1, 2, and 3, the Father, Son, and Spirit conspire together to save sinners. They take us out of the world and our own guilt and sin, out of our lives and places in Jesus Christ, the one in whom God is well pleased, fills us with the Holy Spirit that we might become his treasured possession only for him to give us away to one another again, to live like him, to serve like him. When we believe in Jesus, we die in him, and we are raised in him, and we ascend with him, and he receives us to himself, forgiven treasure, purified treasure, sanctified treasure. Having been received to him in such a glorious way, being added to his family like that, he then gives us back. He gives us to the church to live like little Jesuses to one another. He gives us to the world that we might be lights in this dark place, to live beautiful lives that look like his life, that we might live in this place where he has put us. Always tending downwards, like God living like God's gifts to the world and to one another. That's how we ought to consider each other, the gifts of the risen Christ to us. Do you think that's happened to you? I'm closing with this, of course. Do you think that chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians have happened to you? The Father has chosen you. The Son has bled for you. The Spirit lives within you. Do you think that you have been received up by Jesus Christ and given back to the church? The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are born of God. Because if this hasn't happened to you, then you're on the outside of this story. You don't get the beautiful life of verse 2. You can't live a life of lowliness, a life of humility and gentleness and self-effacing downwardsness. Not only is it not possible, it's not appropriate. Always about self, climbing upwards, never summiting. You don't get verses 3 and 4. You don't get the unity of 4, 5 and 6. You have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus, nothing to do with his church, nothing to do with his family, without God, without hope in the world. Not treasured by him, not given by him as a gift to the world and to others. But if you and I do the smart thing, if we do the right thing, if we come on our knees to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
we ask him to forgive us all of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, he will do that. And he will receive you to himself as his precious treasure. And he will give you to the church as a gift where you will be honoured and loved and cherished there too. To live the most beautiful life that's just like him. Let me uh, read to actually finish then. uh, Just one verse from Psalm 68 and then I'll pray before we sing to close. Psalm 68 and verse 6 puts it like this. God sets the solitary or the lonely in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ever bless you for the gift of the Apostle Paul to us, to give us this uh, letter of yours to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that tells us that these words are yours to us. We thank you, Lord, for being so kind to us as to take us from a lonely, dark existence that is hopeless, without God, without Christ, without hope in the world, and you have placed us in this most wonderful family. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that binds us together as one in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be his hard-won treasure, cleansed in his blood, forgiven of all of our sin because of his grace. And we bless you, Father, for the honour it is to be a gift of your Son, even to the church, your family, that we might serve our brothers and sisters as the Lord Jesus that we might live like him and look like him, behave and speak like him to one another and in the world. Oh, Father, help us, we beg, by the power of your blessed Holy Spirit, to walk worthy of the calling of which we have been called. Teach us lowliness, teach us gentleness, teach us long-suffering, and to bear with one another and to crown all of these virtues with the love of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We'll sing to close then number 336. Happy the souls to Jesus joined and saved by grace alone. Walking in all his ways, they find their heaven on earth begun. Amen.